Hello again, welcome to week seven of this course. Um, I'm going to be talking about multi-stakeholder design principles and give you some more information about the fair shares model ready for the role play. So in this lecture, uh, I want to go through a number of things. The first thing is I'm going to give you a theoretical base uh, looking at both shareholder and stakeholder views of organization design. Um, in doing so, we'll look at some of the original assumptions about why firms exist and how they develop. Um, I will compare uh, how the debate on single stakeholder versus multi-stakeholder has developed over time leading up to um, the fair shares model and its assumptions about four groups uh, involved in ownership and governance. And also I'll bring you right up to date uh, with a new book that's come out about fair shares commons companies. Now we need to start with some theoretical context. So if we go back to the beginnings of corporate, corporate governance theory, um, the work of Ronald Coase and Berlin Means was important for establishing um, entrepreneur and owner perspectives on governance. So the rights of the entrepreneur, the rights of the owner of the organization were explored in these works. So Ronald Coase got a, a Nobel Prize, in fact, uh, for arguing that it comes down to transaction costs. And I'll come on to that in the next one. But I'll, I'm going to very rapidly move on uh, to people who specialised in corporate governance theory. So Sternberg made a very strong defence of the arguments made by Coase and Berlin Means. But as we're going to see, there are others who took different views and argued for multi-stakeholder alternatives. Then we move into uh, the work that you've been asked to read on this module, um, which is about the pluralism in governance systems of social enterprises. Uh, and I'll also take a look at a very recent paper uh, that makes the economic case for multi-stakeholder governance. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Berlin Means and Ronald Coase. Coase argued that we need a theory as to why firms exist at all and why they expand and contract. And what he argued was that entrepreneurs make a decision to employ somebody or not. So somebody starts an organization and based on whether it's uh, cost effective to ask another organization to provide something or whether it's cost effective to employ somebody, you choose between having suppliers and having employees. So in, in this sense, uh, the structure of organizations is a byproduct of the entrepreneur's assessment of transaction costs. Uh, and this has been given the name transaction cost economics. This was advanced significantly by uh, Williamson in 79 and again in 89. Now Berlin means uh, certainly they don't question the assumptions that Coase makes about the rights of the entrepreneur. But what Berlin Means saw is that as organizations grow, entrepreneurs can't control everything. They, they simply, there's too much going on. There are too many people to monitor. So, so you begin to employ directors uh, or you employ managers. In fact, you probably employ managers first to do some of the work that you did. And then as the number of managers grows, uh, there become so many of them that you need directors to mo uh, monitor the work of managers. Now, one of the ironies of this has become, a, has become a total orthodoxy to think of owners, managers, uh, sorry, owners, directors, then managers, and then the workforce. So you have this hierarchy of power. Um, and we apply this logic even to small organizations that Berlin means would never have argued that you needed this complicated structure. So even small organizations are supposed to have boards of directors and to control the managers, even though they may be the same people. Um, so for Berlin Means, it, this was only something that was needed and was desirable 
when organisations become quite large. Now we can argue about what we mean by quite large, um, and it's it's partly um, the dominance of this mindset that has led to alternative arguments being made in in the case of social enterprises or even small businesses. Okay. Um, but the principal thing to remember about uh, Berlin Means is that as organisations grow, power moves from the owners to directors, and then it may, may move from directors to managers uh, as as uh, over time. So there's a, a hierarchy there: owner, manager, workforce, or owner, directors, manager, workforce. Now, what about? this stakeholder perspective so i'm moving forward now you know, 30 40 years um, in the 1980s the idea of a stakeholder became much more popular and sternberg didn't like this shift towards talk of stakeholders so they attempted to debunk and say how unworkable it was um, in the article that uh, i've put on blackboard for this particular lecture Sternberg takes particular issue with the work of Freeman, arguing that Freeman changed what we understood by stakeholder from a stakeholder being a group of people that the organisation can't survive without, like the workforce and customers, to everybody affected by the firm. So the host community, the natural environment, um, local government. Yeah. And and based on that very loose and broad definition of stakeholder, begins to argue that the notion itself is unworkable. So it's key here. So since stakeholders are all of those affected by, so, sorry, all of those who can affect or are affected by the organisation, the number of people is infinite. Now clearly stakeholder theorists are going to challenge that view, but this is the argument that Sternberg is making. And Sternberg's paper has four objections. Um, stakeholder theory is incompatible with business. In other words, the people who argue for stakeholder theory don't like business in the first place. Um, that stakeholder theory leads to poor corporate governance because it's you. How do you get performance criteria for all the different stakeholders? Um, but also, it violates the accountability to the owners. Now, that, what's interesting there is you notice straight away that for Sternberg. Stakeholders are not owners. Yeah, stakeholder is dividing owners from stakeholders, which isn't the case when we come to look at uh, theories later on. Another argument is it's making private organisations too much like the public sector. Um, there's some interesting arguments that Sternberg makes about who has legitimate authority or not, saying that you know, um, for example. Burglars may have an interest in a property, but that doesn't mean that the people who own that property should be accountable to burglars. They're, they're clearly uh, arguments for or and against who you are accountable to. Yeah. Um, and lastly, and this is where I think the the ideological perspective of Sternberg is clearest, is she's defending private property. Yeah, and she's uh, she's defending the right of private owners to accumulate wealth through having complete control over their property. And that, that shows you, in a sense, of why uh, she would object to uh, a stakeholder perspective. Um, so it's quite interesting. There's this statement on page four, business as understood as the activity of maximizing long-term owner value, it's automatically ruled out by stakeholder theory because the value is going to stakeholders, not owners, C completely ignoring that stakeholders could be enfranchised as owners if you designed the enterprise that way. So my my question to you, and for you to think about as you uh, as you progress for, through the rest of this course, is if stakeholder groups like employees and customers become co-owners of the enterprise, do all of stakeholders' objections fall away completely? Yeah, because then the value creation would be for employees and customers, just as it is for um, financial investors. Now, Vinton in, is, is a direct response to Sternberg. In fact, it's a lot of fun to read um, both Sternberg's paper and Vinton's response. I mean, these, these are two academics really going for each other. Uh, it's quite a vibrant debate.
Now that it's Vern, Vinton takes each of the arguments that Sternberg puts forward and, and tries to debunk each one. Um, does a really good job on the first one. Not so sure about the second, third and fourth. The first one, um, not only does Vinton talk about the balance scorecard. I hope you've heard the, the, about the balance scorecard. Lots of organizations use this to develop metrics on, on their performance. But the balance scorecard looks at employees, it looks at learning, it looks at customers, it looks at you have metrics for customers, metrics for, for financial returns, metrics for employees. Um, and, and points out that Sternberg herself is involved in a project on tomorrow's company where she's part of a group putting forward a, a five stakeholder model. Um, so how could Sternberg defend what she defends if she is uh, advocating a five stakeholder model in another part of her working life? There's a the, re the rejection on incompatibility of corporate governance is that stakeholder theory does recognize that some parties might have prior claim as the legal owners. Um, so it's not a question that every stakeholder is equal in stakeholder theory, at least in Vinton's view, um, uh, that stakeholder theory is sensitive to the stuff that Sternberg says it isn't. On accountability, this is quite interesting because uh, Sternberg is implying that the, not unlike Milton Friedman, that the managers and the directors of a business should only be accountable to its stockholders. Well, Vinton says, well, what about the law on consumer rights and employment rights? A company already has accountability in uh, responsibilities in law to other stakeholder groups. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at the long term implications in uh, Sarchetti and Borzaga's works, because what they're saying is that the costs of these, of, of dealing with these uh, accountabilities can it be higher than if you just included them in governance in the first place and made them co-owners. So Vinton also rejects the, the private property claim uh, and the rights of the principal above everybody else on the basis that if you work with your stakeholders, you can achieve a win-win. It's not the case that it's always win-lose. If I collaborate with my customers or collaborate with my workforce effectively, the the principal does better too, you know, in terms of uh, the criteria that they use for success. Um, so it's a false argument in that sense. But I found a limitation in, in Vinton's work. So Vinton never progresses the argument uh, into one that advocates for a social economy. Um, Turnbull advocates for a social economy, as do I in my work, and uh, Sacchetti and Borzaga. That should be two C's in Sacchetti, by the way. So once you um, have multi-stakeholder ownership, uh, the arguments of traditional corporate uh, theorists or corporate governance theorists begins to collapse. Nevertheless, I just want to round off this section on, on the way that the private sector deals with uh, multiple stakeholders is this is a theory developed. Um, I'll, I'll, see, I'll show you the author uh, in a moment, but it's a tool that looks at how much interest a stakeholder has, how much power a stakeholder has, and whether you see them as a key player or not. So the key players you need to direct your attention to keep informed those with a lot of interest but not a lot of power, keep satisfied those with a lot of power but not a lot of interest, and you don't really need to bother about the people who've got a low level of interest and a low level of power. The extent to which a stakeholder could be affected by a decision is the level of interest, and the extent to which a, a stakeholder can force a decision. So if anybody has got the power to force you to take a decision, you have to listen to them. Now, it's rather opportunistic, this. It, it doesn't sort of have any moral grounding other than you must um, listen to those people who've got high levels of interest and high levels of power, particularly high levels of power. But it does encourage you to look at stakeholders. So this is Johnson and Scholes uh, from their book on corporate strategy. Um, it asks you to look at what those interests might be amongst the different stakeholders and how um, a person's uh, affiliation with one stakeholder group might change over time. 
how there might be coalitions between stakeholders because if stakeholders get together that means they might be more powerful in in relation to a particular decision um, and how might different decisions affect different groups so there, there's some um some useful it's a useful model for sensitizing you to the way that you might approach the question of working with stakeholders now now we get on to the sort of i would say the the authors who have directly influenced uh, the work on the fair shares model that you're going to use in the role play so shan turnbull there's two phases of work i would say the early phase 94 95 he seriously questioned Berlin Means and Ronald Coase and has become very influential um, through his work. Um, the key part of this, and he, and he does this by looking particularly at cooperative enterprises, particularly the Mondragon Co-ops and also some public sector bodies in Australia. He argues that uh, efficiency in terms of communication is 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 a is a much more area to be productive much more important area to be productive than just looking at market prices so what what transaction cost economics said is if i go to the market i pay this if i employ somebody i pay that what uh, turnbull argued is that even if the the cost of getting something is x if I can communicate efficiently and, and reach that decision in, in half the time or three quarters of the time, I will be a more productive organization. So good communications makes an organization more productive, which lowers its operating costs, which will ultimately mean it generates more surplus or is more profitable. So rather than using transaction costs to understand firms, look at their communication strategies. And once you look at communication strategies, the difference between private firms that contract employees and cooperative firms that make employees members you suddenly begin to see the economic efficiencies of employee owned organizations yeah now as as Shan Turnbull's thinking developed he wrote a very accessible pamphlet so it's the new, a new way to govern from the new economics foundation um, and he talks about network governance and he draws attention to the Mondragon Corporation again that we've mentioned a few times every enterprise has about three governing bodies it has a, a body a body called the Social Council where every person who works there it can elect people to it the governing council which takes commercial decisions and then a management council which is some people from the management group and some people from the governing body which is elected from the workforce and this he says leads to much better results for the people in the enterprise and for the host community and for the environment yeah uh, and he, he talks about it through uh, the metaphor of ecology so that enterprises can be designed to produce offspring rather than grow into great big uh, mega corporations um, and and they have this is you know this devolvement of power to uh, different boards is is built into the dna of the company through its legal constitutions and even where there are private corporations who couldn't convert to a co-op he says you can still practice network governance you can still have um, think tanks if you like within the organization that in include members i.e the legal owners and non-members which of course includes employees in most cases so non-members and members can get together and think about the future of the enterprise together. Now on to some of my own work. Um, so the, the key thing I wanted to communicate to you was that in my own PhD, which was uh, 2002 to five and then published some of the findings in 2007, I came across multiple people in the sector I'm familiar with, the social economy, where pe people who towards the end of their working lives all believe that multi-stakeholder cooperatives or multi-stakeholder something yeah would be better than what they've experienced in the past they were all drawn towards multi-stakeholder models and one of the papers ridley duff and bull 2019 that's on your required reading list uh, we look at stakeholder model new co-model the cooperative kick which came out of cooperatives uk and the surplus sharing model which we, i was personally involved in 
Now, there's a different theory behind these. The first is the labour theory of value. Yeah, this is actually a moral proposition, really, which is the people who create value should have a moral and legal right to share in it. And the, and the people who create value are the people who provide the labour. Yeah, Money doesn't create money. It's the added value that the labour process creates. It adds value to a product and then you resell it in the market for more money. And if you are participating in creating that value, you should be able to share in the benefits that come later on. And the second one is is democratic theory. You know that if if people are affected by decisions, if you work in an organisation and you're affected by the decisions of the executive group or the the board of directors, you should have a right to participate in the decisions that affect you. Um, so that so you, if you bring together democratic theory and the labour theory of value, you begin to shift towards um, in the first instance two stakeholders, investors and employees. And then you can take the logic further to have investors, consumers and employees. Uh, but in these cases, all of these cases, apart from the cooperative kick, the founding entrepreneurs were seen as a class in their own right. Now that involved, as, as you've seen in an earlier lecture, into fair shares model rules, which enfranchise founders, labour, users and investors. And I'm going to go into this in, in a lot more detail. Just last to deal with uh, uh, Sacchetti and Borzaga, this is a new paper. They work in the European Research Institute for Cooperative and Social Enterprises. And what they do is they talk about the total cost of organisation. And they mention that a lot of traditional theories of economics, they might look at uh, the costs of going to market but they don't consider the cost of contracting the workforce or the cost of contracts with customers. To enter into a contract with customers costs money. To enter into a contract with workforce costs money. Does it cost more money to have labour or employment contracts than to make them members and make them equal partners in the business? They argue that a lot of the cooperative advantage, which the cooperative movement talks about, comes from the fact that it, it gets it gets rid of a lot of costs that private companies incur so they internal internalize these uh, external effects um, and they don't export the negative costs of their operation so in that sense they create more what they call public value now i've got uh, i'm now moving squarely into a discussion of the fair shares model and i've got a couple of, of uh, uh, videos three videos in fact one by somebody else, two by me, uh, from past work, which I will integrate into this lecture. So let's first of all hear from somebody called Rob Jameson. Uh, he is an American and he worked with an Australian called Eric Dorian. Um, and they created any share society. Now, it's not trading anymore, but it's significant because it was the first fair shares enterprise in the United States of America. So let's have a li listen to how Rob tried to sell the idea to people that would be interested. The path of human history radically changed 10,000 years ago during the Neolithic period. During this time, people went from being hunters and gatherers to growing crops, thus creating a surplus of food for the first time in human history. The freeing up of labor made way for technological advances, but also created the need for a leader's class to manage this extra activity. Over time, an inequality between the leading members and everyone else started to grow. So fast forward to today, and massive wealth and income inequality has become the norm. The corporations of today play a very large part in this inequality. To illustrate how things could be different, just imagine the hundreds of billions of dollars that Apple, Microsoft, and Google alone have at hand. Just these three companies alone could single-handedly end world hunger if their cash stockpiles were shared equitably. Modern-day businesses are built by four stakeholder groups. Founders, investors, employees, and customers. We believe that all four of these shareholder groups are needed have a voice in the direction of the company 
and to share in its profits. Not sharing voting and profit with all the stakeholder groups perpetuates inequality within the community. I'm very proud to say that Mass Mosaic has decided to become the first internet fair shares company. As Mass Mosaic grows and earns surplus profits, instead of them being returned to investors only or sitting in the bank, they're going to be returned to all stakeholder groups, including our members. The ability to have a voice in the direction of an up-and-coming company that is set in stone in the company structure is unheard of with the status quo. By contributing to a company that's equitable at its core, people can trust that they are being part of the solution to a widespread inequality that we see today. Making Mass Mosaic a success will spur others to go down this path, and widespread adoption will right a wrong that's been over 10,000 years in the making. Okay, now, um, Mass Mosaic became AnyShare. That's why we, we've got the old name there. Um, he said that it was unheard of to have multiple voices. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. I think there are plenty of examples, as, you, as you've seen already, of other people who were giving voices to people. Um, but, you know, it was new to him. Yeah. So he used the terms employees and customers, but uh, in the generic model, we use the terms labor and users. People will change the labels and you'll see this in a moment. Uh, and the question is, should organizations be structured to recognize uh, the four stakeholders? Is that is that what should be the norm? Yeah. Rather than the exception. Um, so Fair Shares is trying to promote as a norm that we should recognize the legitimate interests of uh, founders, labor, users, and investors. And, and it's for you to look at the mainstream texts uh, that you've been using on your business course and ask whether these stakeholders are recognized in theory. To a certain extent, they are. And are they recognized in practice? Yeah. And, and to what extent? Now, I've, I've got um, I, a few years ago, I, I did what we call the simple guide. Uh, and rather than me reinventing the wheel, I thought it was useful just to embed some of my previous videos in this uh, video lecture. So this one takes you through uh, the four stakeholder groups, how the four stakeholder groups interact as a business develops. So how do enterprises begin? All enterprises start with one or more people who have an idea that they maybe will make them money, uh, but certainly if you're a social entrepreneur will improve society or the community or the environment in which you live. Social enterprises, based on work that is available from sustainable enterprise solutions, suggest that social enterprises are far more likely to be started by groups of people, often six to eight people. In contrast, private enterprises are usually started when a single person goes self-employed, or maybe two people go into partnership. Those founders, at least in the first instance, provide the labour that the enterprise needs to get going. Now, founders usually have two relationships to their enterprise. They direct it and become its directors, and they work for it and become its labour force. And that might be all they're seeking to achieve. They might only be trying to create employment for themselves. But for many, they may choose or be forced by demand for services and goods to recruit more labour so that they can expand their operations. So founders start to recruit other people to help them produce goods and services. They're not just providing labour, they're also recruiting labour. And after the startup phase comes to an end, They'll continue to invest in improving skills in producing goods and services. They'll continue to recruit and develop labour. Now, the recruitment of labour might take many forms. It might be that you're recruiting volunteers or contractors or other individuals and companies that act as suppliers. The labour might be the owner members, you know, the founders, 
or it might be people who were recruited to um, work under employment contracts. So there's a range of legal statuses, but whatever their status, they are all sources of labour for the enterprise and the fair shares model encourages you to treat them as labour members or labour shareholders. Now, as soon as you've got goods and services that meet people's needs, you're going to find that people want to use them, maybe buy them. So that's going to create more demand for labour. But we need to remember that sometimes people might labour for themselves. In other words, they produce goods and services and they consume them themselves. In a food co-op, you might grow food and then you'll use that food. If you put solar panels on your roof, uh, either individually or as a collective, you'll probably want to use the energy that you produce and just sell what you don't need to the market. Similarly, in sports clubs and theatre co-ops, you're going to be consciously uh, creating the um, sports environment and the theatre environment, but you might also buy tickets to go and see what you've produced. So there's a difference between production for use and production for market. In a production for use economy, the workers consume their own produce and they only sell surpluses in the marketplace. But under a system of production for market, people are prevented from consuming their own produce. When you go to work, if you were to take something from work, you might end up being reported to the police. And so under threat of prison, you don't use what you produce at work. So under a production for market system, labour is required to produce for others. And then when they've got their wages, they go back to the market and get goods for themselves. There may only be a few users, large users, or there may be many small scale users. But whichever, for an enterprise to become stable, it's got to have a sufficient number of users to ensure that there's enough work for the people who do the production. And that applies whether it's an enterprise that's doing production for use or production for the market. And lastly, we have investors. Now, an enterprise can expand more rapidly with the help of what we might call non-users who invest additional time, skills and money. Non-users may not be needed. However, more complex projects, particularly if you're going to engineer things, build things, uh, do buildings, construction. They're going to benefit if you can find non-users who can provide you with financial capital. But even if you do that, they're not the only investors. Founders, people who provide labour and the users of products and services are continually investing their time, effort and skills. They invest human, intellectual, social capital and they might provide you with finance capital as well. So we need to say if this is how the world is, why do we design organisations to not recognise all of the interests of necessary survival that we're showing in this diagram here? Why do we not automatically invite people in all of these groups to become legal members of the enterprise? The crux of fair shares is that we believe that if an enterprise does not recognise all the stakeholders necessary for survival, it creates additional complexity because relationships are much more likely to require legal remedies and expensive systems for legal compliance. So in the next part of this video, we're going to take a closer look at the complexity of so-called simple enterprises to understand where that complexity comes from. OK, so it's back to me now in the top right hand corner um, as you as you'll see from that video uh, the the fair shares model doesn't take the view that stakeholders is everybody it, it, it differentiates between what it calls primary and secondary stakeholders so fair shares is designed to enfranchise primary stakeholders all of the people on which the organization depends directly for its future success uh, and what I want to do is compare um, that way of thinking with what happens in private and charitable and indeed other cooperative enterprises. So first of all, labour and users, and indeed in many cases uh, external 
investors uh, are not recognized as the owners of the wealth that their transactions produce, you know, their interactions rather. So when people work and they provide goods and services, um, they're not seen as having an entitlement to the wealth created by the enterprise other than their wages or the goods that they have paid for. The founders, uh, this is particularly true where they control all of the share capital um, at the point of incorporation at the start of the enterprise. They control all of the intellectual property needed to produce the goods and services. They, the, the law gives it to them. Yeah, I work for my employer. My employer can grab the intellectual property that I create and say it's ours. We paid you your wages. The intellectual property is ours. It's a little bit more complicated in academia, but um, that's generally the case. Private enterprises, so they exclude, as a rule, labour and users from membership, but they contract them instead. So they contract them to secure um, their resources. Um, private companies do go to external investors, but only uh, only when they get larger, only when they need more capital that they can't get from the bank or somewhere else, they go and get what's called risk capital. And then they have to include them as members when they do so. So a simple enterprise, a simple private enterprise, does not use its constitution uh, to attract all of the stakeholder, all of the primary stakeholder groups. Charities uh, may have multi-stakeholder governance, but those stakeholders are not supposed to profit from the wealth created by the interactions between the stakeholders. So you have a, a defined user group or a defined group of beneficiaries and everybody else interacts in order to uh, create benefits for that group. Um, sometimes you may be a user as well. I mean, I could work for an organization that runs a club. The club may itself be a charity and then I can use the, the products of my work as well. But the organization is run for the benefit of the users or the beneficiaries, not for the founders, not for labor, and not for people who put the money in. So it's designed to limit wealth sharing, um, and it's not a vehicle to, en to enrich all, for all four stakeholders. It, it transfers wealth from some stakeholders to a beneficiary group. And it's good at that. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes that's needed. I'm not denying that. Now, single stakeholder co-ops, uh, uh, what we might call a worker co-op or a, or a consumer co-op, um, they are the main beneficiary. So rather than external investors taking surplus, the surplus goes to the workforce or the surplus goes to the customers, if you like. Um, that means that they may have mechanisms to put some of their surplus back into the common good, the collective good. Uh, that's the case in many co-ops. In some countries, it's required. Um, in Spain, for example, 10% of surplus must go into social and educational projects. Um, there's no such requirement in the UK, but there was an international norm of about 5% going in um, in the early part of the 20th century. More interestingly, my experience is often, if it's a consumer co-op, they don't want workers involved in the governance. And if it's a worker co-op, they don't want consumers or investors, or indeed, they don't want founders to have any special powers. Uh, so they don't see them as having different interests to their own interests and their own interests predominate. So I, I think it's an improvement, but it's in single stakeholder mode. It can't be a vehicle for enriching all of the primary stakeholders again. It, 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 it uh, puts the interests of one over others, so it's not a genuine multi-stakeholder enterprise. So the Fair Shares model tries to create um, a cooperative enterprise model where all of these groups are legally franchised and they can become a class of member. Now, it depends on the legal model as to whether in investors are enfranchised or not. If they are cooperatives or companies, then they can have share capital and they can become investors in the enterprise. Um, there are legal models for companies, co-ops, partnerships and associations. The partnerships and associations recognize the first three member classes and the other two recognize all four classes.
Now, how does that work out in terms of some case studies? Let's have a look at a few examples of fair shares in practice. So the basic concepts are you've got a class of shares for promoting cooperation amongst workers, a class of shares for the founders, and a class of shares for the consumers. So we call these labor shares, founder shares, user shares. Yeah. People who work and people who buy goods and services may also want to support the enterprise through a, a financial contribution. It would be an investment, not a donation. Um, and that is the basic model of, of fair shares. Those four groups working together um, and you might permit outside institutions to also uh, buy share capital. Interestingly, intellectual property is managed as a, an intellectual commons. There's a clause in fair shares that promotes the idea of the commons, but only around the ideas that are, are required, the means of production, the, the knowledge to produce things. So let's look at three, I think, three cases in the first instance. So um, one, of the, one of the papers that you've got down here, that's in your, on your reading list, is about Resonate. Um, so they have listener members, the platform creators, the social entrepreneurs, if you like, were the founder members and also people they call collaborators. We've got fan members, we've got artist members, and they can become supporter members. And when they become supporter members, they can buy um, a particular type of share that um, rep rep uh, represents their investment in the enterprise. So they've got the four classes. Um, and in fact, there are two diff different classes here um, under that. Um, and they may attract additional money. Uh, they have from a place called R Chain. I think we, we deconstructed this, I think, in our last uh, seminar. So this isn't going to be completely new to you. Let's have a look at another example. So Evolute 6, we'll learn more about them later. In this case, we've got some co-founders who are the founder members. We have uh, clients, this is a consultancy, who become user members. And the consultants who work for Evolute 6 are the labor members. They, again, can take out uh, what they call investor shares. And that's the basic four groups. They, the founders have some investment shares. And also, they're trying to attract ethical investors to also take out investor shares to support the development of the consultancy. They, too, have a commitment to intellectual property. Now, here's one that's more recent, 2020. This uh, was a conversion. Um, VME Co-op. Um, there were two founders originally, and the two founders have given uh, their shares to an employee share ownership trust. So it's another organization, if you like, that um, now owns the shares that the founders used to have. And in, in that sense, the Employee Share Ownership Trust is the founder member. Yeah. They tried to persuade their software users to become members, but they didn't want to. So they, they cut out the user members. The software developers that they employed have become employee members. And the founder members may also be employees. And the founder members will get in investor shares, as well employees will get investor shares. So it's it's three classes of shareholder in VME Co-op. The Employee Share Ownership Trust owns the investor shares, and Labour members can either be allocated investor shares or they can buy investor shares as well. So it's got uh, additional that would give them an additional share of the surplus over and above what they get automatically as an employee. So these are three examples. And the second video I've got from my previous work um, just talks about the impact of this on possibly on the future and, and some of the other contexts in which this has developed. So just uh, one, once this little introduction is out of the way, it will uh, will play the you. These videos are on YouTube, by the way, uh, if you want to watch them again. Welcome to the fifth and final part of this guide to fair shares. Now we get to the crunch. Now we're going to tell you what it's like to constitute a fair shares enterprise based on everything that we've learned so far. In this section, 
uh, we're going to tell you about European social cooperation and the way it's leading to the creation of solidarity corps. In 2007, um, the European cooperative movement uh, lobbied the EU Commission and the idea of a European cooperative society was introduced. And this brought together some of the practices within the movement to combine ownership by users up to 75% or over 75% rather and non-users who would hold less than 25% of the ownership of a co-op. Across the co-op movement, what we've been calling founders, labour and users would all be considered users in European cooperative law. A non-user is somebody who didn't found the organisation, has not provided labour, is not a user or consumer of the goods and services. And the reason that non-users don't get given more than 25% of ownership is to prevent them blocking decisions that want to be taken by users. Now this has led to the idea of a solidarity co-op and in the UK uh, the Fair Shares Association and others like Somerset Cooperative Services have embraced the new principles in cooperative law to create solidarity enterprises and this is a multi-stakeholder approach to social enterprise. So every Fair Shares enterprise recognises founders, labour and or users, that's users in the fair share sense, as classes of member. And if you constitute as a cooperative or a company, you can also issue these groups with shares to recognise them as investors as well. Now fair shares, values and principles can be operationalised through associations, cooperatives and companies. If you use the association model, all you do is create memberships. But if you use the cooperative and company model, you can also issue shares. Now let's consider the order in which things happen in a fair share solidarity enterprise. Because an enterprise is built over many years and all you need to be sure is that your constitution will provide for the future. You don't have to configure everything from the outset. Firstly, founders are necessarily the first people to provide labour and they may also be the first to use the goods and services and make investments, particularly if the cooperative has been established to do production for use. Next come labour. They necessarily do things before any users know of, use or can buy goods or services. And even if users are involved in product and service development, they can't actually use them or purchase them until later. Investors, in my experience, if they invest at all, won't do so until they can see the products of labour and satisfy themselves that there are people who want to use them. So the order in which things occur is founders first, then labour, then users, then investors. Now a fair shares constitution is designed, as we've stressed throughout, to reflect how the world is when all interests in an enterprise are treated as having equal legitimacy. While it doesn't release an association cooperative or company from the complexities of different bodies of law, it does open a pathway to reducing the costs of legal compliance by allowing you to build alternatives to it. Founders, workers, users and investors can invoke clauses in the Constitution and do a number of things. They can share intellectual property. It means that you write into the Constitution different um, conditions of engagement for your workforce and your users. You don't operate the private enterprise system of intellectual property management. Then you can engage in new modes of exchange that don't necessarily have to follow the rules of the market. Your users and your producers now belong to the same organisation. So you can devise your own rules of exchange that don't have to go through market pricing mechanisms. Thirdly, uh, because people are members and because they are equal before the law, you can use mediation to resolve disputes. And we write this into our constitutions. It means that if somebody wants to engage in an adversarial legal process, you can point to the constitution to say, no, you must mediate first. And lastly, because all of these different stakeholder groups are framed as members and shareholders, you can actually practice shared ownership, governance and management.
Let's summarise the argument so far. In all the popular enterprise forms that we're aware of, the norm is to exclude key stakeholders. Usually you enfranchise just one, and you might include others if you can think of a good reason to do so. The logic is the reverse in the fair shares enterprise system. You start by including your key stakeholders, the ones you must need to survive, and you only exclude a group if you can think of a good reason to do so. Now we can think of some reasons or some circumstances in which one or more groups might be excluded. So let's now look at these. Firstly, there can be a case for worker cooperatives and employee-owned enterprises. For example, if you've constituted a business that doesn't supply the public and only supplies other businesses, then it might make sense not to have user members or user shareholders. Similarly, if you're a user cooperative or a user-owned enterprise and your labour force are all users as well, then it doesn't necessarily make sense to have both labour and user members. So in a food co-op, you grow the food and you eat it. In a tenants co-op, you might look after your properties as well as living them. So a first generation fair shares enterprise will encourage cooperative management and governance involving all of the four member groups. And throughout that first generation, it's more likely that you will have discrete member groups. A first generation fair shares enterprise will also still have its founder members. And it doesn't change or end its first generation status until all the founder shares have been cancelled, which might occur when the founders die, or if the founder is an organisation when it is dissolved, or when an individual or a legal entity surrenders their shares because they want to hand them over to the other stakeholders. Now a second generation fair shares enterprise, many of the investor shares will now be owned by users and labour. So you begin to see different patterns of ownership. Labour and users acquire control by actioning the power transfer mechanisms that are built into the fair shares model. So both users and labour can acquire shares in a cooperative and a company through what's called a member share issue. Each time the enterprise generates a surplus, some of that surplus is used to acquire investor shares for users and labour members. So in the second generation, the fair shares enterprise has no founder members and the bulk of the ownership of the enterprise is held by its users and its labour shareholders. So let me now conclude. A fair shares enterprise is structured to reflect real-world complexities in order to make running your social enterprise simpler. That simplicity is achieved because legal compliance with rules that exist to manage conflict with non-members will fall into disuse naturally when they are included as members. Fair shares enterprises can accommodate both production for use and production for market because labour members can also be user members. And fair shares is based on research informed assumptions that inclusive cooperative management addresses complexity to simplify management. So all that remains now is for me to show you the resources that we've created if you want to go. Right, I'm skipping the resources because I repeat them in a moment. Um, so just very quickly, I'm conscious that we're almost uh, at the hour. Um, there's a new book by uh, Graham Boyd and Jack Reardon, um, and they talk about fair shares commons companies. So this is a new wave of thinking and development in around the idea of the fair shares model. And what they're particularly looking for is an intergenerational perspective. And if you think of sustainable development, um, then uh, so, uh, intergenerational outlook is particularly important. And they call this the notion of a fair shares commons company because they're more interested in, in commons resources, not just an in intellectual commons where you share and pool your ideas, but the natural commons of the sea, the land, um, you know, building complexes which are under shared ownership. Um, now they, they, they do away with founders and call them stewards instead. So in any fair shares commons company, you have uh, maybe directors and you have stewards, 
who would generally be different people. And they are both under uh, a particular set of values and principles, you know, uh, moral and ethical values and principles, to consider the interests of the next seven generations when they make decisions. They're more interested in, as I mentioned, the commons resources that go beyond the intellectual commons, so including digital and physical commons. Um, and, and as a result, there's a more complicated uh, perspective on uh, multi-stakeholders. In fact, they have two additional types of stakeholders. In fact, they can have many more. But the ones that are quite commonplace are prosumers, when you produce and consume at the same time, as we talked about in the food co-ops, and donor members who are just giving money to support the enterprise without expecting an investment return. Now, I just want to give you, point you towards uh, one of your required reading papers, uh, which is on the uh, 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 commons-based peer production. So I can't remember if it's Bull of Ridley Duff or Ridley Duff and Bull, but it'll it'll be on the required reading. And it's the paper about the rise of the internet platforms. And what we do is we look at the concept of the commons and commons-based peer production. Um, and the work of somebody called Eleanor Ostrom. Um, and if you've ever contributed to Kickstarter, um, I would look at these three organisations because they are all online platforms that do things in fundamentally new ways. And they're all interesting, they're all well presented, um, and they have resources that can help you to learn about um, the future that is coming and that's based on commons production. Now, Boyd and Reardon have done their, they've created a company called Uni1, and so we can actually see what they've done in practice. So they have their stewardship members who can also be users and labor members. Users and labor still become investor members, and they might bring in outside bodies and social and ethical investors, but they might also ask for donations. So people who donate, they can still have a voice in the governing body as a donor member. And people might become uh, not just labour members but prosumers or they might transition from being user members to prosumers. If you think of Facebook it's the act of using the platform that creates the value in it um, so you're producing as well as consuming or using the platform. So from three to four stakeholders in the basic fair shares the, the fair shares commons company has anything from six to twelve it's variable um, the fair shares basic company is really focused on the current members, whereas the fair shares commons company is on current and future members. The primary focus on, in a common sense, is on intellectual commons, whereas uh, the commons company has uh, got a broader concept of commons. I would say the fair shares company has a stronger adherence to cooperative values and principles, but it does look at SDGs and six forms of wealth. But there's weaker adherence in the Fair Shares Commons company to co-op values and principles and more on what they call adaptive design. Yeah, um, it's still there. It's still a commitment. But I would say that some of the provisions uh, would compromise uh, the, the purists in the cooperative movement. Um, the Fair Shares Commons company restricts the voting power of founder members um, to favour labour and user benefits. The Fair Shares Commons company does allow stewards to have quite a lot of voting power at the start, but it reduces over time. So there's a different way of uh, balancing and rebalancing. And that just leaves the resources page. So um, you can go and look at uh, a list of publications. There are videos. In, uh, I'll, I'll probably upload this video there as well. We've still got our Fair Shares Institute website. Um, and then there's also a course that you can go and look at if you want to work through some of these questions yourself. So thank you very much. I've taken the full hour, uh, so I hope I haven't completely exhausted you, and I will see you for the seminar uh, next week.